NASA is looking real, real bad right now on the pad in, in Florida, and they deserve to look bad. Well, my childhood, in fact, the entire course of my life was basically framed by the fact that I grew up in a magical 10-year period, around 10 years, where uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, covered itself in glory. I saw the whole thing. I watched all of it with my own two eyes, culminating in the moon landing when I was 10. Uh, the Artemis uh, program with the new uh, space launch system, it's been new for 25 years now, I guess, <laughs> uh, recently had a failure on the pad where the uh, it leaked. And we're still looking at that. I'm going to be talking about Artemis in more detail in a Moving Back to America segment. But the fact of the matter is, is that NASA for quite a long time now has been covering itself in something and, and, and glory is, is not exactly it. Uh, NASA needs to get out of the manned spaceflight business. NASA is not an airline. NASA is an experimental research company. And the the uh, the failure of the Artemis program is a good example of that. But this would be a good time to talk about the things that NASA not only does well, but should do well and should be given enough budget to continue to do well. And that is to do fundamental basic science and, and research and probes and so on. Uh, gentlemen, uh, by the way, I'm Bill Little here with Steve Green and Scott Ott. In uh, about a month, not too much longer, um, we're going to have another uh, NASA mission, and NASA has had a string of spectacular successes, a couple of failures, but honestly, going all the way back to the, to the first Mariner missions, this is what they're good at. And coming up in, um, in about a month, we are going to be seeing the results of the DART mission, which is the uh, dual asteroid retargeting test mission. This will be the first time in history that we have intentionally tried to affect the orbit of an asteroid. And it's kind of a uh, proof of concept to see if we are going to be able to use this technology to prevent what the dinosaurs called the big one. Uh, <laughs> So uh, basically, let me just give you a little bit uh, of detail how it works. We're sending a space probe, which is a, it's, it's a spitball, basically, in terms of mass. It's not very big at all, not very heavy at all. And instead of trying to hit a large asteroid, we did that back in 2013 with the Deep Impact mission. We crashed a, a, a space probe into an asteroid, saw a little cloud of ejecta asteroid just shook it off. We're dealing with a relative mass issue here. If I drive a Mack truck into a Mini Cooper, it's going to feel it. If I drive a Mack truck into Mount Everest, it's just going to yawn. So what we want is we want something that's relatively low mass, something that we can that we can see and measure the impact velocity. So as it turns out, there's a binary asteroid system called uh, the Didymos system. Didymos is the big one. It's about half a mile across, and it's got a little moon that orbits it called Dimorphos. What we're going to do at the end of September is we're going to take this space probe called DART, which is moving at a hunk and fast speed. And we're going to ram that baby right into the little one, about 500 feet across. Now, since this little moon doesn't orbit the, well, orbits the sun, but technically what it does is it, it orbits the other asteroid. It's got a very small measurable orbit. We can measure the period and it's a relatively low mass so that by hitting this thing with this probe, we should detect a measurable decrease in its velocity because we're going to punch the thing in the nose about as hard as we can. <laughs> uh, Steve, putting aside the, the, um, just the logistics of all of this, uh, we have known with a high degree of accuracy since, since the launch uh, of where that probe is, where the DART probe is. We just recently, a few days ago, finished an 11-day survey of where Didymos is. And it's right where it's supposed to be. So basically, we threw a dart from New York, and it's on target to land right in the middle of a bullseye that's right in the middle of Beijing, let's say. This, however, Steve, is, is going to be cool. In the, in, the dart, in the deep impact mission in 2013, we smashed a probe after it checked out a bunch of asteroids into an asteroid. And from Earth, we could see yeah, it was getting a little brighter. But this one is going to drop a little box just before it hits, I'm going to drop a little box, and inside that box is going to be a GoPro or something like that. So we're going to be able to see in real time the effect of one of these spacecraft hitting an asteroid hard enough to change its orbit. Not only is that pretty cool, but this one has potential. All space missions give you knowledge. This one could give us the kind of knowledge that could that could change the course of, of 
Let me rephrase this, Steve. This is the only thing that's on the table in the entire society right now that actually could save the planet instead yeah. of instead of things like, you know, not recycling your towels and leaving them on the floor. This has actually got the possibility to save the planet. It really does. Um, and, the, you know, you think back, Bill, when you were 10 years old and watching Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon and you were probably watching on a on a TV screen, maybe may, maybe this big. It, yeah. it, it had a 300 by 200 resolution, maybe something like that. Yeah. And sending back crappy, you know, World War One looking footage and and all the rest. And what that GoPro or <laughs> whatever it is in the box on Dart, and I'm sure is going to be shooting in 4K ultra high res video and sending that back to Earth just as just as fast as those radio waves can carry it. And it's going to be astounding. This 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 is must see TV. But Bill, you mentioned the <laughs> the, the speeds and the accuracy involved. And I, I wanted to, to give a little perspective because it's one thing to go, oh, yeah, you know, we fly really fast in space. Those probes go really, really fast. Well, I wanted to see how they were going to uh, really nail that uh that 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 impact on on something so small, uh, 500 feet across, with uh, with this this with this little dart, basically, and I looked this up, and uh, at three hours before impact is when uh, the cameras on dart, the sensors on dart, will do their final inventory of where all the asteroids are, uh, just to make sure that mm -hmm. that everything is is in its proper place. And at Last three hours out, yeah. and and how long is how many months has this thing been flying? I don't, I, I can't remember I don't know, when they, but, uh, when, when they launched. Years, it. I think. But it, pardon? About a, a little over a year, little, a couple of years, something like that, that. that. Yeah, about a year or so is is probably right. So this thing's been flying for a year. And in the last three hours is when it takes its final inventory. And in the last three hours, it's going to be still 109,000 miles away. 109,000 miles away. It's going to cover that distance in three hours. You could go around the Earth, what, uh, 21, 22 times to cover 109,000 miles. It's going to do that in three hours. At 90 minutes out, at 90 minutes out is when DART will make its final course correction to really, really hit that, that bullseye after a 200 million mile trip or whatever it's been. And at 90 minutes out, it's still going to be 24,000 miles away. Oh, and you know, I... My bad. I did the the math in my head wrong. The circumference of the Earth is about twenty four thousand miles. So you, you, when it's three hours out, you could go around the Earth, uh, you know, a little more than four times, so four and a half times, whatever. But when it's still one one rotation around the Earth away, ninety minutes, and then it's going to go boom. And as you mentioned backstage, I think we all remember our our basic high school physics. Uh, where we get the. Uh, 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 energy equals mass, mass, mass times velocity, velocity squared. Yeah. So very little mass on this little dart. But that velocity squared, <laughs> I can't wait to see that video. Steve, it, was it sounds the, like you uh, just described a fulfillment of a prophecy by Steely Dan. Even, <laughs> even better, maybe. You did uh, leave out one of the steps, Steve. I don't know if you saw the updated version. So all of the mm. things you're saying, th three hours out, two hours out, and so on, then they drop the camera and so on. And about 60 seconds before impact, these two mechanical arms are going to come out of the probe, and they're going to wrap a silk, white silk band around the side of the thing with a rising sun <laughs> on the front. And, and, and then it's going to inject a little bit of sake into the, uh, the uh, electronic cooling systems, and then, bam, Boom. it's gone, and it's not coming back. <laughs> Uh, Scott, um, we have done this kind of thing for quite a while now, and not just obviously with the asteroids. We, the, 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 the missions of discovery, the automated missions of discovery since the end of the Apollo program have been astonishing. Yeah. NASA got us to the moon and and did what it did, and I think everything after Apollo was essentially a mistake in terms of manned space flight, but in terms of unmanned space flight, everything could happen. Mariner 9 goes into orbit around Mars. We get the first real pictures of Mars. We put the Viking landers down on in, in uh, 1976 for the bicentennial. The Voyager probes in 1979 take the first pictures of the outer planets. Pioneers went before that, by the way. Pioneers 10 and 11 went, went before that. We've taken pictures of Pluto. We've taken pictures of every object in the solar system. We've got a helicopter on Mars. This is what 
NASA <laughs> does well. And and clearly things like the space launch system, space launch system, a four and a half billion dollar uh, uh, rocket that uh, has developed a leak because it's the first time we've ever really tested it with full fuel tanks uh, is, is a catastrophe. Um, I'm not calling for the elimination of NASA. I'm just saying NASA needs to go back into the box that originally came in because when NASA does what NASA's good at, NASA does this sort of thing better than anybody in the world. In fact, they're the only people that, that there's nobody else that does this. That's it. That's the only shop in town. Well, and frankly, a mission like this is something that really only a government can do in a sense because, you know- Because th there's no payoff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're trying to save the planet. I know that every company says we're trying to save the planet, but that just means they're going to have two bins in the lunchroom, you know, for when you throw your waste yep, away. Yep. Um, so- <laughs> Yeah. You know, th so this is a, a unique role. Sometimes people say conservatives don't want any kind of government. No, this is a good thing for, for government to do. In fact, only the, the U.S. federal government can do this. And, and right. we are um, unfortunately still exceptional in the world. And so <laughs> it, it, it falls upon us. Um, you know, it's interesting. We were talking on the backstage episode that, uh, that the real accomplishment of the Apollo missions really didn't happen at Apollo 11. I mean, that was great. We landed on the moon, walked around a little bit. But um, the the really hard scientific work, the valuable scientific work happened after that in like 15, 16, 17. Um, or did it go 16, 17, 18? I can't remember. They canceled some missions and renumbered them. But in any case, when they put the lunar rover down there and it expanded the distance that we could cover on the surface of that of, of the moon, so that, uh, or the Lurane, as they call it, it's like the terrain on Earth is the lunar terrain, is the Lurane. And they were able to gather rocks and samples and dirt and do core tests and, and do measurements of things. Um, those missions were really the science uh, that was valuable and, and why really we went to the moon so that we could explore whether can we use this moon surface as a base. Nobody really knew what the lunar surface was going to be like when they landed on it. Were they just going to sink into it as some people had been saying for years that it was just it, it's not it wasn't going to be a surface we could walk around on? No, we could drive around on it <laughs> and we figured out how to do it. So th the same thing with the Mars missions, the fact that we, we we're leaving cars on planets and satellites and, and one is floating out there with the Elon Musk's brand name on it of uh, like, you know, this is what we do um, as a society, but specifically, this is what NASA could do as a government agency is take the lead in cutting edge research that establishes uh, some parameters and ideas and scientific facts that can be relied upon later by private industry so that we can go build a base on the moon and travel to Mars and the rest of the solar system and beyond. As I said, I'm going to talk about the Artemis program, especially as it uh, deals with competitors like SpaceX in a, in a uh, little more in-depth segment. Uh, but right now, uh, there's, a, there's kind of an unsung hero in here. And this is somebody who, who really deserves a lot more, uh, an organization deserves a lot more credit than it's been getting. Uh, in the, the early days of, of uh, the missions of exploration we talked about, the Pioneer missions, Voyager missions, and, and so on, NASA is essentially at a government administrative office. They don't, NASA didn't build the moon rocket. NASA yeah. coordinated the construction of the moon rocket. The, the, the moon rocket was built by North American Rockwell and the, and, and the LEM was built by Grumman and so on and so on and so on. Same thing for these missions of exploration. Now for, for the first, I don't know, certainly for the last 30, 40 years, NASA has been partnered with the people who actually built and control and fly the mission. And that has been JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It's a, it's a subset of, the, uh, of Caltech here in, um, here in California. But recently, JPL has been, I don't want to say upstaged, but certainly has some competition from the APL, which is the Applied Physics Laboratory of Johns Hopkins University. Here's what the Johns Hopkins University Space Program has done. They started with the NEAR mission, which is the Near-Earth Near Asteroid Rendezvous mission. It's the first time I ever heard of Johns Hopkins getting into space. Hmm. They orbited the uh, asteroid Eros in, uh, I don't remember how long it's been now. It's been a while, 2008 or nine or yeah. something. It just orbited it for, for months. And I would just look at these incredible close-up pictures, finally landed it on the surface, just 
bounced it off and stuff. They've sent the messenger probe to uh, Mercury. That's the toughest mission in the solar system is getting to Mercury. It's a hell of a hard thing to do to stop at that tiny little rock when the sun's gravity is, is being so overwhelming. Currently, they've got um, they've got uh, the Advanced Composite Explorer, which is taking a look at the heliosphere. They've got uh, New, Hor New Horizons, which was the Pluto probe, which was booking. That thing got to Pluto in nine years. It got to Jupiter instead of seven years to Jupiter. I think it did it in a year or something. By the way, mm. Pioneer missions and the Voyager missions are the four missions that have left the solar system. Johns Hopkins New Horizons has also left the solar system, but it is moving so much faster than the Voyagers and the Pioneers that it's not going to be long now before it is the farthest object out there and will continue to be the farthest out there. And just as a small little aside, the um, the New Horizons spacecraft, after it finished its mission to Pluto, turned itself around, oriented itself very carefully, took a picture of a part of the sky, and inside a tiny little section of that is where the Voyager 2 probe is. It's only one trillion times too faint to see, but nevertheless, <laughs> they took a picture of it because that's where they're headed. The, the, the accomplishments are just incredible. The, the dark probe is part of Johns Hopkins. Coming up, they've got missions to uh, to fly a helicopter in the um, in the atmosphere of Titan, which is which is Saturn's largest moon. It's the most similar to the Earth in terms of total pressure. They've got the Europa Clipper. They're going to put put a, a, a vehicle in orbit around Europa. They, they, they're just they're just kicking butt, and and so here we are in an age where where finally the technology has caught up to our ambition. And we find ourselves taking the money and the resources that could best be used finding out what is actually going on in the solar system so we can follow up with manned spaceflight. And we're taking all of those resources and money to build a launch system from parts that were made in 1979. And that doesn't fly after four and a half billion dollars and 10 years of of cost overruns and and delays. Oh, uh, Bill, let me say something real quick. Yep. Four and a half billion is the launch price. It was twenty billion to develop and another ten billion to build the ground facilities. Oh, okay then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, excuse me. I'm sorry. Well, you twenty billion dollars. You can launch that thing five times. Woo. Um, just yeah, I'll save that for the for the other uh, segment. But in any event, uh, NASA is looking real real bad right now on the pad in, in Florida, and they deserve to look bad. This is not the business they should be in. The FAA should not be an airliner. The FAA should regulate what private airline companies do. Because if the FAA was, in fact, the only way for us to fly, it would still take us 13 hours to go from Los Angeles to New York in the four-engine, propeller-driven plywood airplane that carried 60 passengers for a cost of $7,000 each per ticket. That's what happens when you get the government out of what it's bad at. And as Scott pointed out, as conservatives, it's getting rarer and rarer these days. But there are some things that the government can do well. And this kind of basic science uh, research is one of them. So NASA, you know, just stop dicking around and trying to be uh, what you're not, and go back to doing what you do well, because what you do well, you do really, really well. And if it turns out, this mission will succeed, I'm quite sure, if it turns out that someday we are able to divert an asteroid that would have ended up ending uh, life on Earth as, as we know it, then that's the ultimate investment, isn't it, really? And you get right down to it. That's the biggest investment that you can possibly make. So looking forward to seeing that uh, that that mission. Oh, and by the way, uh, the w when it hits, it will undoubtedly just put out a, a essentially a conical white ejecta. And so uh, NASA people who've also been responsible for the Artemis program have hired Michael Bay. And once they get that image back, they're going to be adding giant explosions of fire and then there's going to be particles of the asteroid are going to be coming off and and you're going to see how this is you know the probe is going to dodge these things on the way and it's going to it's going to look a lot more uh, cinematic for steve green and scott Ott, i'm bill Whittle. we'll see you next time right here on right angle